Okay. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Well, hi, everybody. Once again, uh, Bob Rocker here. I'm uh, sharing the meeting today because Carrie's out of town. Uh, so, and we, we have a fairly short agenda today, so uh, we'll probably get through this in an hour or less. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> you are a dreamer. <laughs> what, was that a challenge, Bob? Talk about optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe delusional. <laughs> And, and yeah, it's more, it's more likely to, that's uh, it's more likely delusional, but that's okay. You know, I've been accused of much worse. So, um, so we'll get started. Well, I guess with the the roll call, Mindy. Um, yes, okay. I can do that. Ada Anderson here. Andrea Suhaka here. Barbara Boyer. I got a note from her saying she couldn't get in, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Okay. Um, Bob, we know you're here. Kathy Noon? Kathy here? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Chris Lynn? Right. Connie Ward? David Pell. We know here. Dave. Okay. Uh, Don Perez. Here. Donna Mullins. Here. She's here, I saw her, yeah. <laughs> George Teal. He's here. He's just muted. Okay. Arthur Hoyer okay. is here now. And I'm here, yeah. Sorry, okay. I'm late. No problem. Yeah, sorry about that. George Teal is here. Apologies. Uh, Gretchen Lopez. Here. Okay. Uh, Jim Dale. Here. Phil Sernanik. Present. Sean Wood. Sherry Haight Vogel. Steve Conklin. Good morning. Tex Elam. Here. Tom Mahalwald. Here. Valerie Robson. Here. Winshaw. I'm here. Okay. And we have two Dr. Cog employees that are on that are um, part of uh, Amber Lieberman is part of our CAM department. That's our communication and marketing team. And then Ashley Summers, who is uh, one of our directors who will be um, presenting later on. Okay, thanks, Mindy. Are Who's there any other- Dr. Rex guy just popped up. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good morning, y'all. Are there any, any other introductions that need to be made? Uh, I think everybody's introduced yeah. themselves. Do we have okay. any guests on? Uh -huh. so, uh, I'm yes. Allison Cutting with Douglas County. I'm here as a guest. Thank you, Allison. Thanks, Allison. All right, I think we're through with the introductions. Are there any public comments? Allison has one. Thank you. I was trying to find that my I was raising my <laughs> trying to find my virtual hand, but I raised my real hand. <laughs> I just wanted to let everyone know that Douglas County is um, in the midst of doing an older adult initiative that was um, initiated by the Douglas County Board of County Commissioners. And we are about halfway through. We're doing 11 to 12 listening tour events. And we have another one this afternoon. And um, so it's really great. So we're going out, we're getting really good feedback from our older adults. They're very appreciative. Um, so we're doing the older adult listening tours, gathering information. We're doing a, a resident survey, and then we're gonna do a provider survey. So we're very excited about what we're learning and how we're gonna incorporate it with the CASOA report and some of the other um, you know, surveys and reports that we've got. 
Allison, thank you so much for that. We are so excited. We've heard a little bit about it from Carrie Erickson. Um, uh, could you uh, do me a favor and send to me the the dates of the the remaining ones, including today, if that's possible? Yeah, not a, not a problem. Thank you so much. Allison, I had a question. Uh, as you're going through the listening tour, uh, how are you recruiting or choosing your participants? So we are not choosing the participants or recruiting them. We're just, you know, our public, we're working with our public affairs office to get the information out. We've reached out to, um, you know, city council members, um, elect, local elected officials. We're posting it on next door and we're also going to go out to some of um, the assisted living places and try to get some um, some feedback from residents who are not physically able to come but we have a I think a nice um, variety we're going to both rural areas and uh, more urban areas uh, the larger areas for instance Castle Rock we're having two meetings Highlands Ranch we're having two meetings um, some of the more rural areas, we're just doing one. But, um, and we're working very closely with Aging Resources of Douglas County, um, you know, because they do their food distribution and we're working with our partners that we have to get the word out. But anyone's welcome to come. Um, and, you know, anyone's welcome to come to any of them or all of them. So the more the merrier. And we are, we're getting great feedback and we're getting really good conversations going and everyone has mentioned how pleased they are and how happy they are that we're doing this so and uh request for Jayla once you get those dates from Allison dates and locations if you could share that with the group that might be absolutely yeah and I can post a link to our website um in the chat okay, okay. that's great thanks that would be helpful thank you and so Allison um just what have you learned so far? I'm just curious about that. Uh, well, nothing new to all of you that people would like more transportation options, um, you know, services, transportation. Um, we had heard at the beginning a lot about property taxes and just the cost of living is difficult for people who are nearing retirement or in retirement. Um, you know, I, I, hate to sort of say it's the same thing that we already sort of already know we're here, but we are hearing a lot of also people would like, um, you know, different housing options. Um, you know, some people would like to downsize, but they're worried about taking the, the um, senior tax exemption with them. Um, other people would like more, you know, sort of the 55 plus communities. Um, so we're really, we're really hearing a gamut. Okay. Can I, can Angie I just, has got her hand up. So I just wanted to, Allison, would you please also, I, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but Jayla will be speaking at the Seniors Council of Douglas County meeting in September on September 7th. And she's going to be talking about the Douglas County information on the CASOA. So that might be something to share with the participants of the listening tour. But yeah. They're invited and, to that meeting as well. Oh, for sure. And that's another thing that we're doing is we have uh, quite a few resources um, related to a lot of these different issues that people are taking and our resources continue to grow. Um, but we do have information, for instance, on Dr. Mack, you know, for transportation options. We have all sorts of things. And that is one thing that we have out there is the Seniors Council of Douglas County. Super. Thank you. And has a question. Yeah. Um, Allison, have you gotten your local coordinating council up and running yet? They're the transportation people that you want. Yeah, so we're still, um, it that has not been um, restarted yet. Uh, we're waiting for that. There's a position that's open right now. And so we're waiting for that transition to be complete. Good. Thank you. I just had a, a quick point on this uh, property tax exemption thing. And um, 
I wish that somebody who's who, who's a, are better at the economic calculations than I am could just uh, create a couple of examples of, hey, if you do move out of your home and you do lose the property tax exemption, are you better or worse off depending on what kind of a home you move into? Let's say, let's say you sell a home for a million dollars and you move into a half a million dollar home. Well, then you have a difference in your property taxes and everything else that goes along with it because it's smaller typically. And uh, I think that too often there's this, this reaction that says, well, I'm going to lose something rather than thinking about what I might gain. So, yeah, anybody... you know, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And I know that our um, county assessor's office is very, it in Douglas County is very responsive to our residents. So, um, but that is, that is a good point. What we're trying to do really with these listening tours is hear from our residents. And so we are, you know, taking down all the information that they are responding to and, and the, the comments they're giving. And we're trying not to make um, sort of recommendations or comments now until we synthesize it all from what we hear from all the different areas. But that's an, that's an excellent point. Well, and it's not just for Douglas County, I mean, anywhere. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, All right. Bob, Wynn's got her hand up now. Okay. Wynn? Thanks. Oh. Um, I have kind of a point on the other side that um, many of us uh, seniors have lost a spouse along the way. And if we didn't sell right away, we may have a large capital gain to pay when we sell our homes, which may be keeping us in homes that are way too big, um, because if you pay the capital gain tax, you can't even afford to buy something smaller. So um, just uh, as we're dealing federally, that, that legislation many years ago that allows the $250, 250,000 per person uh, in, price appreciation uh, not to be taxed, if you're up more than 250 and you're a single, um, that capital gains tax that seniors used to get a one-time exemption no longer exists. So it makes turnover in the housing stock far more challenging. That's, uh, that's really important information and, and information that we can carry back and I hope Doug, you will here and, and carry back in the housing um, uh, uh, work that we're doing um, when, and you, you know, the housing work that we're doing uh, as, as Dr. Cog, uh, that's important information and, and important advocacy um, that we should think about how we can influence that um, change because it impacts a lot, a lot of people. Yeah, because I must say we are hearing people, they want to downsize but there's reasons why that either they can't find, you know, single story housing or they're worried about the capital gains or the, you know, the cost of just the costs of moving, so. Great, okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions before we move on? Okay, so uh, report of the chair as uh, the chair has nothing to report. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then we move on to the report of our AAA director, Ms. J. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks for joining us today. So excited to see you all. Um, I just want to kind of talk about what I'm working on and some of the big issues that have happened in the last month. I, it's just crazy, right? Um, it's never dull in the area agency on aging. Uh, we, I spent the last three weeks or so um, working on comments for the Older Americans Act. So the Older Americans Act was reauthorized in 2020. We kind of didn't pay attention to it. I don't know. We were busy with other things like COVID. Um, <laughs> and uh, so was the rest of the world and, or, or the country. Uh, the uh, ACL decided to uh, update the, the regulations 
uh, in accordance with the Older Americans Act. So they are doing rules and regulation process um, and we had to turn in comments. I was working um, with AJ on our comments, uh, worked with US Aging, CTAC and C4A uh, to provide comments on all sorts of rules. Um, it, you know, they range from comments about nutrition requirements and um, they're changing, they wanna change the definition of uh, at-risk adults. And it all looks good on paper, right? You think that, but then you start to think about what that's gonna be required. So anything you make a change on, let's say the definition of at-risk adult means that we have to change all of our assessment forms, which means then our um, a, a initial assessment that we do of individuals is going to expand the time, right? And there's just more paperwork and more paperwork and more paperwork and more cost. And um, the challenge with the Older Americans Act is at the same time the Older Amer Americans Act was reauthorized, they did a funding bill to go along with it. Older Americans Act passed, the funding bill did not. So we have new regulations and new requirements and no new money to implement them. So we were really trying to give feedback on make it easier for us, not more challenging. Um, when uh, I was at the USA conference with AJ and Sharon, we also gave that feedback to the, the administration on community living, please. I mean, we don't have additional dollars. So please try and streamline things, make it easier, more flexible. I'm not sure where we're gonna get, but a whole lot of people um, really uh, commented and, and gave um, good recommendations. There were some really positive things that we hope stay and then uh, we hope we can get less rules and more flexibility in some of the other areas, particularly nutrition. We don't need no, any more requirements. There's already 44 pages of requirements around nutrition um, in the Older Americans Act. I don't think we need any more, thank you. Um, so that was a big push and uh, getting all of those uh, uh, in and the meetings that went along with them. We are working a lot on advocacy right now. Was there any questions related to that? Okay. Um, we're working uh, a lot on advocacy. Uh, I really like our new federal lobbyists, Thorn Run Partners. They have been super attentive and um, helpful and provide you know weekly information to us that just kind of keeps us aware of what's going on. Uh, good news, the Farm Bill passed and the Farm Bill had a lot of regulations uh, that related to uh, Meals on Wheels programs. Um, so it provided additional money nationally for Meals on Wheels programs, which was a good thing. Um, we, are, we are watching carefully and when, when um, uh, the legislators come back, uh, we're hoping that the reauthorization and moder modernization of the Elder Justice Act passes um, or uh, because this provides additional funding for the long-term care ombudsman program and also would provide funding to area agencies on aging to reduce social isolation, um, which is one of those very important things that we know we need, um, uh, but really don't have a lot of direction on how to do that and don't have the funding to do it. Um, the ombudsman program you all know and hear from uh, Shannon Gimble, the challenges in nursing homes and assisted living. We, we need more support of the ombudsman program than we ever, oh, well, in the last 25 years, for sure. We are seeing things, um, it, it's tough times still in, in nursing homes and seeing all of those things related, primary to lack of staffing, you know, uh, pressure sores, people not getting their meds on time or getting the correct medications, uh, bathing not being done. Uh, timely or for months in some cases. So it is, it is very important uh, that, 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 that uh, I would love to see that bill go through. The state, you uh, may remember that we uh, sent a letter to the governor and it was included in your packet, right, Mindy? It wasn't included in the packet because we just got it. Oh, okay. No, the letter to the oh, governor? To the governor. 
Um, I think we included in our activity report. Oh, okay. So it's in the activity report. Um, and we are asking uh, for increased funds for, old, uh, for uh, AAA services for all the AAAs in the state of Colorado. Um, the request is ambitious, I think, a, a $5 million bump, and then, or one time to kind of meet the needs and catch up with where things are going, and then to um, have a, a formula that would increase with inflation and population growth so that we didn't have to go back to the legislature every single month and try to, um, or every single year and try and get more funding. Andrea, you had a question? Yes. <clears throat> I wanted to remind you that the state is now giving free education for those folks who would be um, the nurse, the aides in nursing homes, you know, firemen, teachers, but them also. I don't know how well it's doing right now, but I think it's this school year that that starts. Yeah. Um, there have the state has been um, doing a, a couple of initiatives to try and bring more people into the field to provide care in nursing homes and assisted living. We're still struggling with that base pay um, as an issue, right? Um, and the work is hard, and so we need to make sure that um, that the the nursing homes in our region are quality, and that the state does. There's a lot of money, both federally and statewide, uh, designated to improve the quality of care in nursing homes um, in particular. Not a lot about assisted living, unfortunately, but CNAs can also be in assisted living, and that would be helpful. Assisted living, the acuity of staff and or the acuity of residents in assisted living has gone up pretty significantly. Um, it looks much like a nursing home, and they don't have the staffing requirement levels that nursing homes do. So um, uh, the ombudsman are busy in those areas and we can get an update. Yeah, Phil. Uh, just a, a question is the ombudsman is, um, uh, I'll say spreading out to the proliferation of assisted living facilities. Um, you've mentioned about the acuity in of the residents uh, in, increasing. Um, that's not unexpected because as they age, within those facilities, that's something that's just gonna happen with aging uh, there. Um, how is the ombudsman's interface with the assisted living facilities and the fact that there's so many of them uh, that are proliferating now? How is, how is that yeah. <laughs> meshing or not meshing? Well, we, uh, the, each ombudsman is assigned a number of assisted living facilities. So it's a, it's a big number. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we could probably hire 25 more staff and still be challenged by what we're seeing. Um, Shannon, as you may recall, leads, um, is the chair of the assisted living advisory committee at the State Department of Health and is actively involved in the regulations and developing regulations and the implementation of the new regulations. Um, it is a challenge to get out there. They're only required to go out quarterly, as you recall, but they have to respond to complaints within three days. So any complaint that comes in from assisted living based on the kind of complaint it is, they have to respond within three days. And so that is, uh, that's where they spend a lot of, so those facilities get a lot of complaints, we're in a lot, and those that aren't, that's one of the challenges. I worry about those places, because as you know, I was an ombudsman for many years, that we're not hearing from. Why aren't we hearing from them? Um, and, and quarterly, I feel like is probably not enough given the acuity levels. But um, again, another reason why I'm really interested in, in the Elder Justice Act passing, uh, bringing more funding to the ombudsman program, um, because th these are some of the most vulnerable people that we serve, right? Um, and assisted living doesn't have the level of staffing that nursing does, nursing homes do. Um, and so I, I feel like we could up our presence there, but 
but we are responding the best we can. Yes, Phil. I'm just going to make a comment to those folks that are appointed by the counties and may be elected officials. Uh, one of the challenges with assisted living facilities is that um, they're, they're kind of granted their ability to exist uh, without any discipline on their pro forma in being able to have a financial picture that deals with the increasing acuity that would be expected of residents over time uh, before they may be passed on to a, a long-term care facility. Um, and so uh, just one of those things that I think is a gap in the approval process uh, for these. And so uh, the ombudsman is kind of the after fact um, uh, regulation component, but it's also one of those where approval on the front end uh, for these facilities is something that doesn't have the rigor that possibly should exist. My two cents. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I want to jump back to the state advocacy. Um, so in addition to the letter to the governor, we um, met with the uh, our rich and, and our state lobbyists are meeting with JBC members. I will be joining them on some of those meetings uh, to talk with JBC members and, and possible sponsors for a bill in case that we don't get into the governor's budget. Uh, and just talking about strategy and how we can uh, let people know what's going on in the importance of community-based services. Um, we're also trying to enlist our community partners, our contractors being one of the biggest ones, right? All of those contractors that we fund, um, they stand to lose significant money by 2025 if we don't get increased funding into the bill. So all of those you know, seniors resource centers, senior hub in, in, um, in Adams County, um, ADRC, um, or ARDC, the Aging Resources of Douglas County, um, all of those contractors stand to lose money because we're going to lose money. We're going to lose about $7 million between now and um, 2025. And that's about a third of our budget, and that's going to impact the lives of people that we help. Um, and I, I, I can't tell you the urgency I feel about this in my body and my mind and my heart, because it, it may mean for the first time that we actually have to take away services from people who have them, not just add to our waiting lists, but take away services from people that have them. And we've not had to do that um, before. We're reaching out to community organizations, Next 50, AARP, Bell Policy, anyone that we can help ask uh, or ask to help us uh, and support us. Um, we will be asking you um, to help as well. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. Uh, we wanna engage and enlist those partners to help us figure out how to do this as effectively as we can. Um, we are in, in, currently in the process of engaging clients and caregivers, gathering client stories, client videos, um, and looking for ways for our advocacy opportunities for um, people that really want to talk about the importance of those services in their lives. We're gathering data. So AJ and Zach, Zach Feldman, who's the program manager of data science and analytics at Dr. Cog, is really combing through our data, looking at trends, looking at demographic data, all sorts of stuff, looking at spending, um, putting together information that we can uh, show the legislature uh, and, and all of our partners uh, why these uh, the funding trends, um, the service data. Sharon and her team are developing scenarios. So one of the things that we need to talk about is what it might look like in 2025 if this is actually implemented, uh, or it's gonna be implemented. If we don't get funding, this is what's gonna happen. And we're developing some different scenarios, which we will share with you when we get them as well. Um, and then working with the other AAAs in our state, right, on 
um, helping them get coordinated. We are fortunate that we have so much, we have a big team at Dr. Cog, professionals, experts. Um, Sharon did a training for the other AAAs on how to project forward um, and, and, do, and give the budget kind of scenarios that, that we're looking at for the other AAAs who don't have near the staff that uh, we do. Um, we are working on developing messaging. So there is a subcommittee, which Bob is a part of um, and uh, others uh, and staff that are looking at developing messaging for different audiences in different platforms. So our contractors really wanna help in this advocacy. And so we're trying to package those messages for them so they, they don't have to do the work. They don't have the staff to do the work, working with our communications and media team to, um, to do that and then hand it off and they can put it on their website. They can use it in their presentations. Um, I will be attending the Volunteers of America uh, legislative breakfast. I will be attending the, um, the uh, senior uh, resource uh, barbecue, legislative barbecue. Um, so they're inviting me to come out to their legislative uh, outreach efforts as well. Um, we plan to, uh, of course, use no copay radio um, <laughs> and other media uh, to talk about uh, these issues. Um, we had something happen that was a little bit frustrating. Uh, you know, we've done this before. This isn't new. If it, those of you who have been around a long time, we have been, we go after funding when we need to go after funding. We ask the state unit on aging every time we do this for their support. And um, we have never gotten their support. And we got a letter saying that they weren't going to support us this time either. Now, nobody's ever put it in writing before. And so that uh, that was kind that they took the time to put it in writing, but somehow it made it feel worse to see it in black and white. Um, they did bring up some concerns of, of why they didn't want to uh, support it. And that was the carryover. And so one of the things that I have to do is address the carryover. So statewide AAAs have had carryover. Um, and I think you know why, but I'll explain why we've had carryover. Remember that every single year, Sharon has to turn into a, bu a budget into Dr. Cog and the state that allocates all of our funding. And sometimes there's carryover. Um, the state allows zero carryover, no carryover each year. So we can never have any carryover there. The federal government only allows 10% carryover. That's how we budget. During COVID, Remember, we got a huge increase of funding, more money than we've ever, ever had. And they, the state, um, uh, eliminated the carryover requirement. So we could carry over. So for those 20, 21, and 22, we had large carryover amounts of money. The state directed us how to spend the pots of money. They would say, spend this COVID pot of money first, then spend state dollars, then spend federal dollars. Then we'd get a new pot of COVID money and then they'd say, spend this pot first and this second pot of COVID money second and then the state money, then the federal money. Um, so we did that. We are fortunate to have um, a finance team, right? To manage all of our money and all of our contracts. And Sharon had the insight to manage that carryover so that we could extend services knowing that the the serve or knowing that uh the the regulations were going to go back and the new care the old carryover requirements would be implemented and so because of that we have been able to extend services longer had we not had the um covid funding we would have seen this two years earlier, this fiscal cliff, right? The COVID money filled in these, these um, deficits. Other AAAs did not have the foresight to do that. And 
ran out of money last year before the end of the calendar year. So we were fortunate to have Sharon and her team, um, but we're the largest AAA in the state and whatever we do impacts the entire state. And so we had bigger carryover because um, we knew we were gonna extend services. The carryover will be spent at the end of next year. We show that, but I have to show that. And I will show you that when we get together a PowerPoint. So Rich has directed me to put together a PowerPoint. So the letter from the state, we will, we will send you a copy of the letter from the state, but it basically talks about um, the, the, it talks about two things diversity, are we serving and are we contracting with diverse providers? And then the carryover as areas of concern. We're doing great in diversity in our areas. We contract with the Southwest Improvement Council, which is a, um, a, 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 an organization that has Native Americans and low-income um, uh, Hispanics. We have contracted with the Asian Pacific Center for years. We have contracted with the African Center for Health. We have contracted with um, LGBT or folks serving LGBT community. We have good diversity, probably the best diversity in the state. And we are now gathering the data on um, diverse populations that we are serving so that we can report that as well. Um, so I'm putting together a PowerPoint that will address all of those concerns because the legislature, the governor will likely go to the, uh, the state unit on aging and say, hey, we got this request from the area agencies on aging. Tell us about it. Um, you know, what do you think? Do you, and they're going to say they don't support our request. Again, not new. This has happened to us every time. That's okay. It's frustrating that we can't be in partnership. Um, but we still have a responsibility to serve the people in our community, and we don't have enough funding to do that. And they don't have to deal with, you know, the, the consequences of not being able to serve folks. So we're going to go after this funding. I don't know if we'll be successful, but we have to try. We absolutely have to try. And so we will be on this path. Um, you often ask how... Um, can ACA members be involved? We're going to need your help advocating, but we're going to put this information together for you and have you have um, speak, you know, topics that you can speak on, opportunities to join meetings if you're interested and, and if it serves you, your area. Um, help, help, this is where I really need help is help craft the story that we should be telling, particularly to legislators. Um, what, what, what's gonna be most impactful, right? Identifying other leaders we could reach out to and then, and, and then tell us what information you need from us. We are working on this. Our goal is to have the messaging done by September. We will bring it to you and you, um, and we really do want your feedback. So that's a lot, sorry. Um, okay. anyway. <laughs> but it's important, yes, Bob. Well, well done. Um, it's the uh, question. So as you prepare these scenarios of this pack, this informational package, um, <clears throat> will it include anything that shows, okay, what's the, what would be the cost of a person not getting XYZ service? Um, <laughs> I think what so we're what looking, that, yeah. What would that cost the state and then multiply that by whatever numbers? Uh, yeah, so we had this discussion with Zach um, uh, yesterday talking about the cost of not providing service, right? Um, and what we usually do in these kind of scenarios is think about what if they don't get in-home services, they have to go to a higher level of care. And most people go on Medicare pretty quickly. Um, uh, Well-to-do people it usually takes them about two years before they're, they're paying privately. Um, and that the cost of that 
to the state. And so we have used that effectively in federal advocacy before and in state advocacy before, and we're updating those numbers. Um, so we're really depending on Zach to help us tell that story. Um, he has a he has an economic background. He's just amazing. Um, uh, and and but I'm going to be interested in in if it connects with you, if you understand it quickly, right? Because we can get complicated, and complicated is not what we need. We need quick understanding and understanding that this is going to have impact to this to the individuals that that we provide service to that will need service in the future. It will have in, impact to our communities and it will have impact to the state of Colorado um, very quickly. I'm hoping that we can do that. And that's the goal. Well, yeah, the JBC, yeah. JBC will want to see numbers uh, for yeah, sure. They will. So yeah. you, but you have, you know, you have two impacts. You have humanitarian and you have a economic both. And um, I wonder, wonder both of those will appeal to different people. In different Hearts ways. and minds, right? Hearts and minds. You're always going for both. Yeah. Okay. Other, other, any other questions of Joe on that? Wim? Yeah. And I guess I would say that there is, um, there is an impact not only to from a financial standpoint of what this would do if people are disenrolled from some of these benefits, but there is cost savings associated with pre-planning delivery of certain benefits, right? So I think that that is a cost that people don't think about. But if you're um, you know, a senior who's been getting meals on wheels, and all of a sudden you're now starving to death, getting nothing, and and you know maybe somebody sneaks you a meal here and there, and you get on a new waiting list or whatever. Um, just the processing of the paperwork and the waiting time, despite the the human loss, um, they would have been better served to keep them in the program with ongoing meals um, because of that cost of emergency services rather than pre-planning just yeah to... absolutely i mean the cost of providing that's a perfect example because our meals are you know um 12 13 dollars um ish um and that uh, that investment in that individual can really reduce the cost of a lot of other things right especially emergency room visits where the uh, right. a, a huge amount of people are are admitted, older adults are admitted with a diagnosis of malnutrition, right? Because then you have, how are we going to get food to this individual? They're not getting food. They're not. Get, they're getting sick. They're getting right. And then now everything is compounded. Their meds aren't working well. You need to eat in order for your medications to work. All sorts of things happen. It is hard to. Um, I think everybody knows that. So I hope. I hope hope that we're successful. And I am really, um, I am so grateful that we have local elected officials on this committee, because I think you have that experience and know what will be so important to talk about when we're talking to legislators um, at the state. Jayla, you mentioned a $7 million cut and that being a third of the budget. All things considered, would that budget be going up instead of down by a third? What were we? Uh, I, I'm just wondering: is the impact bigger than the one third? I'm sorry, I don't think I understand your oh, question. Seven, um, seven million gonna, dollars would be the loss. Yeah. Seven, seven, seven million from next year's budget. Is that what you said? Um, at, in 2025. So we'll see some next okay. year. And then by the time we get to 2025, it'll be $7 million. Okay. And then do we have any kind of indication on, on how the $5 million request uh, to the governor is going to go down uh, if it's likely to be? So we would likely, there's a funding formula for the state of Colorado area agencies mm -hmm. on aging, and we get about 48% of that funding. Um, okay. And then we would see an increase, right? So right. we're trying, we're still going to have to 
be lean. But we, we, we don't think we would have to cut any programming if we got that $5 million. We would okay. have to tighten up and be a little bit leaner. Um, right. uh, but I, I think it's, it, it wouldn't be as devastating yet. Would I like 10 million? Yeah, I just don't think I could get it, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, uh, but what we really need also is that growth piece because our older population continues to grow. And so it's so important to have that um, uh, being able to grow as the population grows. Okay. And when will we uh, hear back from the governor's office on what to expect there during next year's session? I don't know. I have, I, I talked with Rich about this yesterday and, and we don't have a really good idea yet. Okay. Well, sounds like a challenge. <laughs> it's okay. We're up for it. Okay. If if this were to happen, I'll work with you on corporates because um, I think we need to. It, it takes time. Uh, corporates and family offices. I don't want to wait until we get our back against the wall. Okay, that's wonderful. Well, and as you're working on the projections of um, older Coloradans in a position of need, uh, one of the things that's going to be happening is. Um, folks that are less prepared for their older years uh, because uh, they've, you know, we're eliminating or we have eliminated pensions over time and folks have not been able to save. And so it's not just an increasing population, but it's also an increasing population magnified by those in need as a percentage. I think that's really, really important information. I'll make sure that I talk with Zach about that because you're absolutely right about the 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 need of those older populations increasing uh, because we don't have the kinds of the current a lot of the people that we work with have pensions, right? Just like you said, and have uh, good social security, and uh, folks aren't going to have that uh, going forward. And we know. Uh, what you know that very few people have enough savings um, uh, or when they retire to to live successfully and so are going to be much more dependent on state and uh, uh, federal programs. Well and if the uh, feds don't deal with the issue uh, at some point in time there's going to be reduction in social security benefits. Yep. As well. Yep. That's the actuary in me, sorry. Yeah, no, a, a very important uh, to remember those things. It's hard to tell all that story, right? So um, I know that Rich is working on getting uh, uh, the opportunity to report to um, maybe some committees, right? Uh, and, and you get like 20 minutes to talk. And so it's like, how do you combine all of that stuff into one 20 minute presentation because it's so huge. And also our legislature tends to look at next year and maybe the year after. They don't look five years down the line. And so that makes it challenging as well. Well, and I hope in So I think we have to focus on this is going to happen, right? This this is going to happen. People are going to lose services come October 2024. Um, really. Hey, Andrea, you had a question? Not so much a question as a comment. We're talking so much about funding and the lack of the money that's needed. I think it would be very important to stop the duplication of services. Dr. Mack is out there doing things that you're doing. Let Dr. Mack do them. How much money will that save if travel training gets done by Dr. Mack? I mean, think about where services are duplicated and ways to save money there in the Denver area. We, we definitely have to do that. That's no question. And to be clear, we're not doing travel training right now. And, and we don't know that we will be doing travel training. So um, we are trying to figure out transportation is one of those areas that we are trying to figure out how to serve 
the growing demand in the region and it is getting overwhelming. Um, uh, transportation, food and housing and in-home services. Those are what we hear about the most and it is concerning. Well, you really seriously need to look at things that you are duplicating that are out there already in, in the real world and get we that, do that. And, back. And, <laughs> okay, thank you. Sarah, do you have anything else to report? Jim has a question. Oh, sorry, missed that. Jayla, we probably talked about this before, but help me understand of the 7 million shortfall in 25, how much of that was related to COVID uh, associated funding? Uh, yeah, the, that, the majority that, that of that was, is. The other funding source that we lost was the um, Homestead Act funding, right? Yes. So that was, that's a chunk. And we were getting over, you know, I think the most we got was 5 million from that. And then it kind of trickled down. Um, we had 1 million this year and then it's over. Um, so it's a combination of the COVID funding and the, the homestead funding. And then the fact that we haven't gotten increases from the state, and this is what Zach is working on to show that we've actually have, if you factor in um, inflation, a decrease of like 26% from state funding. Um, so we will be able to show that to you. And, and my whole goal is that when I show it to you, if you understand it quickly enough, um, or do we need to clarify it um, so that people have a, a good understanding? Well, I, I, uh, just a suggestion would be, uh, we would probably increase the number of people who are serving because of these funds and they were people in need, but the people that, are, we have a growing list of people that, with needs, and if we can show those the increasing demands plus the increased number we serve because we had the funds uh, during this time of crisis, uh, I think that would be helpful too. Thanks, Sheila. Sure. Thanks, Bob. I think we should move on, Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think we should. Do you have anything else, Jayla, before we do move on? No, I don't. Thanks. <laughs> Just wanted to be sure. Okay. All right. Next item on the agenda is. Um, uh, um, somebody needs to make a motion to approve our last agenda and uh, minutes of our last meeting, which was in June. I'll move. Okay. I'll second. Andrew. Okay. All right. Is anyone opposed to approval? Okay. Motion carried. Let's move on then. So our, our next uh, is an informational br uh, briefing from Ashley Summers. So uh, we're going to talk about new accessibility requirements and the effects on the AAA. Ashley. Excellent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen here and get started. Um, so my name is Ashley Summers. I'm the Director of Strategic Implementation here at Dr. Cog. And, uh, one of my roles is to take on organizational projects in kind of an ad hoc fashion that need to be dealt with. And this is one of those things. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're going to talk about Colorado accessibility law and how that is affecting Dr. Cog and the AAA and our strategic approach to addressing that. So just a little bit of background here. Uh, Prior to House Bill 21-1110, uh, there, there was accessibility law in place uh, at the state and federal level. What House Bill 21-1110 did is make those rules more stringent and importantly, putting in penalties for noncompliance. So that's uh, how it is, is much different than, than past laws. And then Senate Bill 23-244, um, quote, cleaned up that language by reducing the penalties to remove per person per incident language. So it did help to address um, our concerns about 
um, our risk of, of financial penalty, but it did not reduce the scope. So we there still are um, some concerns that we'd like to discuss about it, uh, even though we do agree with the spirit of the law. Rulemaking is going to occur this fall, so we're planning to be actively involved in that to see if we can get clarification and even further um, clean up or refinement through that process. And the deadline for compliance is next summer, July 1st of 24. So we are very interested right now in figuring out how we can pursue compliance um, and also mitigate any unintended consequences or negative effects from the way that the law is written currently. I'll get into that a little bit more. But first I wanna talk about the scope of these laws. Um, in a memorandum that OIT put out, and OIT is the, the rulemaking body, uh, they said that every person who contributes content to a website or application develops or manages IT products and services, and every government entity employee who creates and shares emails, documents, or presentations is responsible for making it accessible to everyone. Uh, so clearly that's, that's a very large scope. This applies to any content that exists in digital form. So that includes external digital communications like web, video, email, and PDFs. It also includes internal digital communications, our internet, software, and tools, in addition to all of those documents and resources. There are no exemptions currently in the law for technology that's developed by third parties. And the kicker here is that there are penalties for non-compliance. So even though the cleanup bill did address um, how often or how frequently you could be fined, um, there are still there's still quite a bit of financial risk. Um, we could be penalized um, per violation and also be liable for uh, attorney's fees and damages. So. <clears throat> now that we've kind of covered the, the scope, excuse me, my office has a lighting issue. <laughs> um, so we've covered the scope. You can kind of see how, how large that is. But um, before we jump more into this, I do want to take a step back and talk about what accessibility considerations even are. Like what, what are we being asked to address um, in reality here. And so just to give you a brief intro into this, we're talking about um, some very detailed aspects of documents like color contrast between the text and the background, um, not using color as the only way to convey information so that people that can't see color or can't see it all don't have to have that um, attribute in order to understand um, the message. We're talking about adding alternative text to visuals by explaining the visuals so that people can read um, what the image or photo is conveying. We're thinking about reading order, um, which means that instead of allowing um, a reader to like jump around a page to consume content, having kind of a sequential reading order so that a screen reader um, knows how to navigate through the document. Uh, we're talking about avoiding ableist language, like as you can see, um, designing tables simpler. Tables are a big issue for screen readers. Um, and also leveraging accessible functionality that's already available in the tools that we commonly use. So for example, in Microsoft Word, uh, if you use headings and styles, bulleted and numbered lists, and saving things as a PDF then, uh, or as an accessible PDF rather, then you're already leveraging some of the functionality that's there that um, inherently makes it easier for screen readers to read. And so this is just an example of how that plays out. Um, you can see in some of these recent publications that we have remediated, that we have increased our contrast uh, between the text and the background, We've added alternative text to the photo so that someone who is using a screen reader encounters that photo and it reads to them, this is a close up of an older adult couple smiling so they can understand it in the same way as someone who's visually interpreting that image. So, so now we've talked about the large scope, um, what it means kind of in practice. And now I'd like to talk about um, Dr. Cog's approach based on what we know currently. So we first want to 
adhere to the spirit of the law. We are interested in taking steps to integrate accessibility into how our organization functions, because this is better for everyone, not just people with disabilities. We wanna make our communications as easy to consume as possible. Um, we also wanna comply with the letter of the law because we need to limit those negative impacts like penalties that expose us to financial risk. We also want to continue communicating per our mandates. We are here to do a job. We are federally mandated to do certain things. Um, and through our different funding streams, we are required to provide certain types of communications and services. We wanna keep doing those. Um, and specifically related to the AAA, we want to continue contracting for community-based services. And finally, we want to use our resources wisely, um, and we're a, a little concerned that the way that the law is written might incentivize us to, to use them um, unwisely. We'll get more into that. So first, I want to set expectations um, with everyone, with this group, that the scope of the law as written right now is extensive. It includes our websites and applications, digital documents and emails, it's external facing and internal facing. Um, it covers things administered by a third party that we don't necessarily have any influence over, um, yet we would still be liable for. And instead of just looking to the present and future, it is also looking into the past. It is retroactive. So considering the law is currently written, uh, Dr. Do Dr. Cog will need to extend significant resources to achieve full compliance. And, and to be honest, full compliance uh, with our current analysis does feel out of reach. We do have an approach um, to start working through this, and that includes an inventory to itemize the products that we feel are subject to the law, to assess those, to determine which of our products need remediation, and then prioritize those to put them in a strategic order so we can start working through the queue. Um, simultaneously, we're working on mitigation, uh, which means reducing the negative impact um, that we might uh, <clears throat> be subject to if we don't remediate by the deadline. We're also looking into prevention. That means implementing training and policies and procedures so that the new products that we create um, it don't need to be further remediated. They're already accessible. And throughout this process, we want to show our intent. We want to make a good faith effort to comply and be good working partners uh, with the state. So uh, let me give you some insight into the status um, of where we are with some of these um, uh, our strategic approaches. So with our inventory, we've started um, looking at all the documents that we have on our external facing website, drcog.org. Drcog.org is just one of nine external facing websites that we maintain, but it is our primary. Um, and uh, fortunately for us, we have been undergoing um, a refresh effort for, for several months now. And so this um, assessment of documents from an accessibility standpoint actually dovetails really well with our plan to refresh the look, feel, and functionality of the website as a whole. So now we are just um, kind of pairing those initiatives together. Um, we are working to assess and prioritize the documents um, as we create this inventory. Again, focusing just on drcog.org right now with an intention to look at um, our many other um, websites. Uh, and at the moment, we are separating these things. We're kind of painting with broad brushes to, to look at how we would put these things in three different buckets, like the, the need to remediate now versus the need to remediate in order of priority to be determined, and then pulling things offline. In terms of mitigation, um, we have reached out to our partners at CCI and CML already. Um, and we are planning to develop shared talking points that we can deliver during rulemaking um, that will help us explain the anticipated impact to our organization, as well as uh, put forward some potential solutions that we think could um, reduce the scope of the bill in a way that uh, mitigates those negative impacts, but still embodies the spirit of the law and allows us to work towards um, the accessibility of 
of, of many of our documents and our external facing site. In terms of prevention, we are in the process right now of developing uh, resources like accessible templates and trainings to make staff more aware of what they can be doing on a daily basis to make their communications more accessible. And then finally, um, in terms of intent, uh, at the moment, what we're making progress on is developing accessibility statements. So these are statements that we would put on our websites and also um, a shorter version printed on our documents that indicate that if anyone is having trouble uh, uh, getting the information out of the document and needs accommodation, um, it will tell them how to seek that accommodation so that we can fix it for them. So it, I think it shows that we are interested in providing that accommodation, but we have a long way to go towards full remediation. So um, kind of zeroing in here on the AAA, we have many challenges that are specific um, to this work, and that that comes with the high, val high volume of documents that the AAA puts out. Um, these are documents, videos, emails, all of these need remediation, um, and they come in several different versions because of um, multiple languages. So there's just, the, um, there's a lot of documents that need to be uh, put in the queue here. Uh, as we've just discussed, funding is already inadequate. Um, fiscal cliff is approaching, and and this is an this is unfunded. This work would be we don't know how we will pursue uh, remediating this high volume of of products. We're also unclear right now on how to deal with third party sites like Network of Care, um, and we are hoping that through rulemaking we will get more information on on how to deal with this um, because this is. I mean, network of care is um, uh, very important to us and our client base, and we don't know of other options. So it's, um, and it would be difficult for Dr. Cog to take this on and, and replicate its functionality. Um, and regardless, it will, all of the options are expensive there. So, so we are interested in seeing um, how rulemaking turns out and if there are more options reveal themselves over the next few months. At the time of writing this presentation, it was um, unclear if the requirements were going to pass down to our subcontractors. Um, we have recently had some conversations with our legal counsel, with Dr. Cog's legal counsel, and um, they have instructed us that a, a subcontractor would not um, would not be subject to the law simply because they receive funding from Dr. Cog. Um, they may be subject to the law for other reasons, but simply because of their connection to Dr. Cog does not make them um, subject to the requirements. Um, that's, of course, just the interpretation of Dr. Cog's legal counsel. I think that we will want to run this by OIT and, uh, and other people throughout the rulemaking process to make sure that we're interpreting that process um, and, and getting that message uh, reiterated. But that's our, our first pass um, through it is what the interpretation is. We do have a request for, for you all um, as we work through rulemaking um, through the end of the year. We need your help to amplify our message that, um, that, that we believe in the spirit of this law, but that as written, it does have negative, uh, it could have negative unintended consequences. We definitely foresee that. Um, our talking points at just a very high level right now are that the cost and the effort to remediate currently exceed our available resources. Um, that puts us at significant risk of financial penalty, which could incentivize us to communicate less, and that's not what we want. Um, and we do think that there are ways to address these challenges by reducing the scope in some very reasonable ways um, that allow us to still continue pursuing the spirit of the law, um, but uh, make it uh, more reasonable for us to pursue that. So, um, so with that, I'd like to take any of your questions. Ashley, there's been several in the uh, chat that Doug has oh, wonderful. answered. So do you want okay. to them off? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, let... All right. Uh... Well, there, there was there, some of the questions had to do with uh, any any organization outside of the state agency. So, like a five hundred one c three four whatever a nonprofit or 
uh, things like that. Yes, um, the the law talks about public entities. Um, it also mentions state and local governments. Um, so uh, for Dr. Cog, it's not ambiguous uh, because we're an association of local governments, but uh, for nonprofits, uh, I'm, I'm not able to speak to that. I think we need to seek legal counsel for that. Yeah, yeah Mr. Um, Bob, Mr. go ahead. Go, go ahead, Jayla. Um, the, the guidance that we've gotten from the state unit on aging and the, uh, the, the state uh, risk assessment office says they, they believe their interpretation is if an entity receives state funding that this will apply. But that was, we got that information two months ago and literally things are changing. You know, it feels like every week there's some, some different interpretation of this. So I, 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 we really do need to understand this. Um, Doug, if you wanted to. Yeah, I think there is some ambiguity there. I, uh -huh. I don't believe that nonprofits in, in particular are um, required under this law, but um, but we can check on that. We can ask our legal counsel her opinion on it for sure. I think the key is the state funding. If you receive state funding, that's what the, the risk assessment officer told us at the state. Okay. Uh, but the Any, question here, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Ashley, that's fine, please. Um, I was I was jumping into one of these questions, but it looks like Doug already um, answered it. So, Ooh. sorry. Please, please go ahead. Any other questions? <laughs> Do we have a cost estimate of the amount of, you know, I presume this is staff time as much as anything? Um, Absolutely. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. So I, I think some people have put out fiscal notes. I don't have that um, readily available, and maybe Jayla or Doug does. We have uh, we're in the process right now of coming up with estimates. the The part of the issue with that is just like understanding your inventory is a, a huge effort in itself. Just figuring out what you have to even um, to even create those costs. But just to take this down to like a, a very um, excuse me. There we go. <laughs> I need to get my lights fixed. Um, so, uh, for example, we have, we create board agendas for our board of directors uh, every month. Um, we have just gone through a process to understand how we would need to remediate those. Um, now, and we're not even talking about the past ones. We're talking about building an accessible template and then building off that template and remediating every month. Um, say, if we think that those packets are about 150 pages, um, which they often are, then um, best case scenario is that's 40 hours of remediation. Um, and so that, uh, with the tools that we have available to us, so that's using Adobe Acrobat Pro, and that's, uh, so one of the things that we've been learning is that the technology is just not really there to help us do this quickly. Um, so we can achieve uh, the, the compliance if we work very hard at it, um, but for some things, maybe that's not reasonable. It's just not enough. We don't, there's not enough time in the day to do it for everything. So we've really got to prioritize. Um, with that said, the, the law doesn't talk about prioritization. It talks about everything. And that's, that's really what our concern is. Yeah, for, for the AAA, I think one of the things that talks about internal and external, right? So the irony here is that we have worked really hard to get most of our stuff digital um, so that it's accessible, um, so that staff in the field can take it so that we don't have the printing costs that we had before, right? Um, all of our assessment forms, all of our assessment forms are digital and there would, and it, and it would be required to be remediated, right? All of the ship, documentation or the ship brochures, all the show brochures that we are required to have, um, we have been trying to make digital. Um, and I don't know if we're gonna be able to continue to do that because that's a lot. So what I'm trying to do is get an inventory of everything and look at the must do's, the stuff that we need to do right away to keep us the business rolling, right? Compliant, 
with the new requirements, compliant with our um, contractual requirements with the Older Americans Act, figure all of that out, which, which forms have to go first, which brochures have to go form first, and then we start talking about other things, right? So we're gonna have to do this agenda and we're gonna have to do the ADRC agenda and um, any PowerPoint. I may not be doing many PowerPoints <laughs> right now. Um, you know, what about the old data, all the COSOA information, all the four-year plan information, all of that. And I, I feel like we're gonna have to make some really hard decisions and that is figuring out what we can have. And I feel like it is going to reduce the information that we're gonna be able to provide. It's gonna have the opposite effect of the law intended, that the law intended to make it more accessible. Um, it, it's gonna, I'm gonna have to take things off of our website because we can't fix it and make it. Um... Bela, Donna has a question. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. How far back do you have to go? That seems kind of excessive to me, but who's gonna monitor all of this? Like what kind of budget does the state have to monitor Dr. Cog and everyone else? Thanks. Um, so it, it goes back forever. It's uh, right now, it's everything, which we do feel is unreasonable. Um, and the state is, they're monitoring other state organizations and that the state organizations have to um, submit a plan. Uh, Dr. Cog, it would be in the, the category where we have to have a plan, but the state's not going to to, we're not required to turn it in, but we'd have to have it available if they ask. But really, I don't think that we're worried about the state um, leveraging anything against us. I think we're worried about predatory lawsuits. We're worried because this the, the penalties can be leveraged by anyone. Um, and we think that uh, there's a possibility that there will be just law, for, law firms scouring our, our website and trying to find someone to bring a claim against us. And so we'll have to we'll have to fight things off that are truly not legitimate. They're just for profit. That's the way ADA has worked all along, doesn't it? People have to, I mean, people have to submit the law for the um, lawsuits against people who violate. ADA requirements? Yeah, this makes it easier. Uh, it, this, this would be an easier process to take action than it's not a lawsuit requirement, it's a claim. So it would be easier to, to file a claim against someone who didn't have accessible information. We just had this happen a couple of uh, uh, well, I guess probably a couple of months ago now where we had a complaint from someone who was blind um, and we were dealing with that complaint regarding transportation. And um, he asked for information in an alternate format. And I was thinking, oh, wow, you know, had this been a year from now, we, we would be subject to a fine. Um, He's also with the Federation of the Blind and so was quite angry with us that we wouldn't take him to the airport um, for his trip to Australia or come back from his trip, coming back from his trip to Australia. And that's not really what our transportation is for. But um, he, uh, he, he put a blog on um, the All Federation's right. website. Well, yeah, no, yeah. It, but, but that's, that just shows how far it could go, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah, like Mr. Chairman, if I may, sir. Please. <laughs> Thank you, sir, very much. No, I, I just wanted to say, and 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 um, first of all, we're so thankful that Ashley is is taking the point point on this for us. She's so well organized and and is and is great. She actually just sent us out an email this morning with uh, kind of an update on where she is with this process. And, and I also, what she mentioned, you know. We will be or we're planning on being a party to the rule once they start rulemaking. Um, so we're very interested to kind of dive a little deeper with the state as well as as other partners to begin to explore if there are parts of this uh, parts of this rule rule or sorry parts of this law that are are just a little too unwieldy. 
Um, I think, you know, some of the stuff that we are really concerned about relates really, you know, to external um, stuff, right, with regards to the, the use of third party software and the like. And I'll give you an example. I mean, we use a, uh, a transportation package is our travel demand forecasting tool, which we use to forecast future um, future trips, right? For And we do that as part of our, our long range transportation planning process, which we're required to do by federal law. Well, under this law, the that third party software has to has has to be um, that accessibility level has to meet this standard. Well, this third party software uh, vendor is a national, excuse me, international vendor. And uh, we have no leverage over that vendor to do what we th we uh, believe this state law requires them to do. So what do we do in that case, right? Do we just not fulfill our federal mission? It, it's just, there's stuff like that that I think I, it's, that has been lost a little bit. Um, you know, I think we want to try to create a pragmatic approach and how we do this. There is no one on this call that disagrees with the intent of this law. Um, we just want to be in a in a place which you know we can fairly implement it to make sure that um, you know we're being as accessible uh, accessible as we can. Um, so we're you know we have there's going to be some nervous times for all of us as we go through and and we've already talked about the unintended consequences of ultimately may have to take pull stuff off our website which is unfortunate but um but you know we you know we don't have a war chest for to to fight any litigation and all that kind of good stuff here at dr Cog. so thank you sir very much appreciate the time thanks doug um and yes i very much appreciate the situation that you folks are in and the the, the rule making part of this is critically important so it's it's happening and Hopefully you, you get enough input in there yeah, along with other agencies. I'm I'm sure I'm sure there are plenty of other people scratching their heads wondering how we're going to do this. <laughs> so, it's interesting that this law got passed two years ago, you know, and uh, it's only now seems to be coming to the surface. But, um, I guess it's part of the the process. But, okay. Um, <clears throat> Ashley, thank you very much, and uh, that was that was a very uh, helpful and interesting presentation. So our, our uh, next item on our agenda is the Dr. Cog board report. I guess that would be you, Steve. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate it, and thank you all for all that you do. Uh, it's good good joining you for these calls. Uh, a couple of things from Dr. Cog. We are excited uh, this week. Our Finance and Budget Committee approved the ability for Mr. Rex to negotiate a contract uh, with a consultant for our regional housing strategy, which is a, a big deal. We've talked about that here before, that uh, obviously housing in so many ways is, is just a huge issue. And Dr. Cog is, is trying to help with coming up with a regional strategy, looking at an assessment of what's out there, looking at ideas. We know that the governor will be bringing things forward again in the next legislative session. So trying to be ready for that and to be an active partner in those things is, is a huge part of it. Um, at our last meeting, we discussed the draft 2024-2027 transportation improvement program where a lot of those transportation dollars go and assorted air quality conformity determinations. Uh, just really looking at that, that big document that governs a lot of the spending on, on transportation dollars. We also dealt with uh, or have had some updates on the Front Range Passenger Rail District, which is, is interesting, exciting, contentious, all of those things all at once. Uh, we also got an update on the transportation program distribution formula uh, that that is is an interesting situation that that uh, kind of governs where state dollars go to transportation. And Dr. Cog is at a little bit of a disadvantage in terms of we have one vote on that body and all of the smaller, more rural areas each have a vote as well. So uh, Ron Papsdorf just gave us a, a presentation on that so we could be thinking about that. It's not unlike what Jayla talks about in terms of the funding of, of the AAA. Uh, you're looking at funding for programs and, and how that gets divvied up. And then we also got a report on the Regional Bus Rapid Transit Program, or BRT. Uh, speaking of buses, I think everybody knows that RTD is free still until the end of the month. Zero fare for better air. And if you haven't taken advantage of that yet, you have until the end of August to uh, travel for free. That's all I've got. Uh, 
Any of the other Dr. Cog board folks have things that you want to share? Or Doug? I I have one uh, comment. It's more senior focused than um, than uh, you know board activities because um, I think you did a great job summarizing what we had done at our last meeting and some of our challenges. Um, I would like to uh, simply give a shout out to Sky Ridge Medical Center who celebrated their 20th anniversary last week. Um, they were the first hospital in Douglas County. So Douglas County didn't have a hospital wow. until 20 years ago, oh, wow. which is quite an amazing thing. Um, and we like to say that uh, although Lone Tree is not that big, there are 56,000 people who have Lone Tree, Colorado as, as the location of birth on their birth certificates. So we feel like a really big community of, of uh, people at that point. So just a, kind of a little point of fun for everyone today. Thanks. That's awesome. Okay, thanks, Brandon. George, did you have a question, comment? Oh, you muted. I did. I did. Allison uh, Cutting uh, talked about earlier at the ACA meeting we're doing here in Castrock today. Well, here it is yeah. uh, right now. I'm going to be signing off, uh, but because uh, we got to get to the work that we're doing. But I just wanted to take a moment and share with you guys what our listening sessions look like. This is only one of the many ones here in Castle Rock. And uh, yeah, we're here to listen. We're here to find out what we're doing well, but really we're here to find out what we could be doing better and what we should be doing better. As a family. That's awesome. So, um, Yay. So uh, happy. Thanks so much. <laughs> thanks so much. So I'm going to be signing off and, and leaving early. I just wanted to sign off with this. Everybody have a great time. I'll see you again at our next meeting. Yay. Okay, thanks. Bye. All right. Bye bye. Donna, did you have another question, uh, comment? Yes, I just wanted to say congratulations to Dr. Cobb for addressing housing. When I did my master's in gerontology as an intern at Dr. Cog in 2000, I could not even get a meeting with the director. So I'm very happy <laughs> to see that progress. So, uh, Steve, I have a quick question for you, you and Wynn both, um, yes, regarding the, regarding transportation. So, is there any separate initiative within Dr. Cog transportation um, focused on getting older adults tra transportation? Um, you know, singularly focused on that because it comes up constantly. So, I'm just curious about that. And, and Jayla and Doug, feel free to jump in if, if I misspeak or, or give inaccurate information. I think that most of the, the senior specific transportation issues are addressed through the AAA. In terms of the TIP program, uh, most of those are mobility in a general sense. Uh, and I don't know that we've had many of those proposals that have been specific to senior. Uh, but but trust me, with Wynn and myself and Commissioner Teal and, and others involved, we we are all we are thinking about it. Uh, and and you know, I think there's a, a lens towards that. But I'll I'll defer to Mr. Rex if I if I misspoke. Yeah, please, Doug. Uh -huh. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And, and Mr. Chairman, Mr. Steve Conklin, Chairman, thank you for the comments. I I will say on the funding side, um, you know the last couple tips and this is true for the upcoming tip which will go into effect as of october 1st of this year um you know we have uh the board has set aside monies directly for for um for senior transportation or paratransit services um and they've increased that amount this next next tip uh, from one million to two million dollars annually so so the co commitment of the dr cog board as far as uh funding uh transportation funding um will will be eight million dollars over the next four years and that's that's a significant amount um of monies then and, and i'm so pleased that the board has um, has expressed that desire to kind of offset the funding that that is received through the older Americans Act and the older Coloradans Act. So that's that's le that's legit money. I and Steve is right that for the uh, for the most part, 
Um, now, now transportation staff works in partnership with the AAA, but the but uh, services specifically for seniors is is kind of uh, directed out of out of jailer shop. Okay, thank you, Doug. Thanks, Steve. Thank um, any other any other questions or comments for Steve? Okay, hearing none. Then we have uh, county reports. Do we have any county reports? I guess not. Nope. Oh, Gretchen. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. I just want to take this opportunity to really express um, our appreciation for Jayla um, allowing me to be interviewed for No Copay Radio and promoting our Vintage and Vibrant event, which is going to take place September 28th. Um, it's our effort to keep our older adults um, engaged through learning and also making social connections and give them an enjoyable day. It's going to be at the Pace Center from 8 to 3.30 in the afternoon, so a full day of learning and fun, and I wanted to I wanted to just express our appreciation for that opportunity. Okay. Wonderful to promote that event. Uh, it's so much fun. It is so much fun. And um, I, I always get a lot of information and have a good time when I'm able to attend. So if you all can attend, you should attend because it's, it's, it's good information. Um, innovative. I mean, you always have creative things there. And then, you know, uh, just being able to connect with people. Absolutely. Much needed. Yeah. So Gretchen, I'm wondering if you could put something in the chat about your event. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll work on that. And I'll work with Mindy, too, to get you an event flyer. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Donna? I lost my thing to put my hand up, but I just want to say Jefferson County is sad to miss some um, to lose Carrie Johnson, but we're really happy to have David Pell join us. And also I will be joining um, the funding subcommittee, I guess, kind of by default, but <laughs> I'll, I'll be there. But thank you, Dave, for joining us. Well, Donna, nobody hit you over the head, you know. You just... <laughs> kind of, kind of. <laughs> It'll be interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions, comments before we close? Okay, well, hearing none. So I only missed it hey, by- Hey, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah. She, she's here. She's just uh, <laughs> quiet. <clears throat> okay. Well, thanks so much, everybody. And uh, have a, have a rest, great rest of your Friday and weekend. And uh, we'll see you again next month. Okay. Bob, let's just Bye. make sure everybody knows it's in person next month. Ah, yeah. What's that? Let's make sure everyone looked at the agenda that it's in person next month. Really? Where? I missed that. <laughs> so. I, just, I just got it set up for the Cobol Library. So um, you'll have all that information. Uh, huh. when, we, when we send everything out, we'll give you a map and everything to find it. But I just wanted people to kind of put it on their calendar because we're, we're we're not really used to actually driving and seeing each other. So, you know, y'all might need to go clean up a little bit. <laughs> okay, oh, that's not any fun. We have to actually like shower and do our hair. Exactly. We can't come in our pajamas. I know. <laughs> Shoes. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be terrible. So. But yes, that's good. <laughs> well, that'll be fun. It'd be great to see everyone in person again. Yeah. Where is it? Where, where, what part of town is Cobol or whatever you said? It's in Centennial. Okay. Well, it's actually, it's right at Holly and um, Orchard. And Orchard, yeah. So okay. it's kind of Greenwood Village, Centennial. It's, it's you know, okay. right in the middle. It's, it's a nice library. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very nice library. Easy yeah, parking. Good, good space. <laughs> Free, good parking. Free parking. Yay. <laughs> so I, I got asked for a few suggestions and sorry they were not in Lakewood, but I know only really know my section of town. So I kind of gave people in the middle. So, well, I think we decided uh, to you. kind of rotate around a little bit so that nobody goes too far in one direction every time. Well, thank you. 
Thank you. The, the bigger mm -hmm. question is, do we do we need to bring our lunch? Or, um, no, <laughs> we're going to actually, we actually have money in the budget to buy you lunch. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Very good. And yeah. it won't be peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> okay. Excellent. All right. So just put, I just want to make sure that everybody like, you know, that, 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 it's kind of just a line on the agenda, but that's because we pulled it together between when the agenda went out. But in person, <laughs> looking good. Can't wait to oh, see you all. Okay. Yeah, it's on page two of the agenda, Brett. Yeah, you know. we didn't get that far. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, okay. yeah. great Thanks. job, Mr. Vice Chair. See you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody. Take Thank care. you. Bye. Have a great weekend.